The title for this morning's talk is Tarot, Link Between Self and Subconscious States. Now, if you will recall, last Sunday morning, we were discussing the subconscious physical relationships as taught in Kabbalah. And in a way, you might say this is the same subject, although it has a slightly different slant. Uh, it is aimed more, that is this morning's talk, at trying to show you some of the ways in which uh, subconsciousness reacts to self-consciousness and vice versa in order to help to understand the workings of consciousness as a whole. And indeed, we will continue with uh, further explanations, I think, probably through this whole month uh, when we bring up the tarot to show just what the real underlying elements are regarding the principles of subconsciousness and their effects upon the rest of our lives, uh, our activities, our thinkings, and so on, as well as just what we might do about gaining more control of these areas of our being. Now, <clears throat> in tarot, if you look up above me there, you will see tarot key number one, the magician. This is the symbolic representation of self-consciousness, or also referred to as the power of attention, which really is the power of self-consciousness primarily, though self-consciousness has other elements. The power of attention is its basic uh, element, its basic power. Now, right next to it, number two, the high priestess, this is a, a symbolic representation <coughs> of subconsciousness. All through the tarot series, however, we are showing uh, the three phases of consciousness self-consciousness, subconsciousness, and superconsciousness in their various symbolic appearances so that uh, your inner knowingness can be stirred into learning how to differentiate between these states and thereby gain more control over those that require control. But we are going to talk mainly this morning about the powers as they exist and as they act in terms of the Tarot key number one, self-consciousness, the magician, attention, and tarot key number two, high priestess, the power of subconsciousness in essence. Now, first of all, we need to try to understand a little more about what we mean by subconsciousness. We did speak about it last Sunday morning, but let's enter a little more into the aspects that are involved. For example, let's consider hypnosis. Uh, under hypnosis, it has been found that there is a part of the mind, because really, whether we say self-conscious, subconscious, or superconscious, we're always referring to the one mind, although it has three levels of activity, almost as though uh, we were thinking of an ocean, and the ocean were divided into three parts. The divisions are not real. They are relative divisions. Uh, basically, we are consciousness, which includes all the other aspects. Now then, if we think about subconsciousness uh, in terms of what happens under hypnosis, we discover some very interesting things. For example, we discover that subconsciousness has an extraordinary power, or seems to, because uh, a hypnotist, if he has what's called a good hypnotic subject, uh, can suggest, and notice the word suggest, because this all acts through suggestion. He can suggest to the person under hypnosis that, that that person is being burned. Now, he applies a cigarette uh, to the burn according to what the hypnotized person thinks. However, what he might be touching uh, the hypnotic subject with might be just the end of a pencil, and he is. But he says, this is a burning cigarette. Uh, and instantly, a blister comes up. A real blister, incidentally, that has to heal. Now, this is really an extraordinary type of phenomenon, if we only knew it. Uh, the fact that believing or accepting a suggestion can bring about the type of condition which usually comes only if we actually did burn ourselves with a cigarette or something else. Therefore, consciousness must have something to do, and certainly the subconscious part of consciousness, must have something to do with the effects that we experience uh, as witness, the fact that a blister can be raised, and many other things. Uh, the hypnotist can tell the person under hypnosis 
that uh, they can't, uh, this person cannot bend uh, his arm or his leg or that he's rigid, and instantly this occurs. Uh, they take ten strong men to try to bend an arm or a leg, and it's impossible to do it. The strength and power of subconsciousness, or what appears to be subconsciousness, is so great. Now, one of the problems is that we do not seem to realize that, in essence, a person under hypnosis is merely in an extreme condition of what, in actuality, is taking place all the time. You and I, when we walk around thinking we are awake, are very partially awake. We are very much under a state of hypnosis. We are very much under a state of suggestibility. And this state of suggestibility causes us to accept all sorts of things or all sorts of ideas, which incidentally perhaps may not be so. And this is often the root of most of our problems the fact that subconsciousness accepts an idea, accepts a situation, then reacts to it. This brings about conditions like the blister. You might say it's the blister in our environment or the blister uh, in our relationships. <coughs> now, we know that there are an extraordinary number of schools of thought dealing with various phases of metaphysics. And we also know that uh, a good many of these schools of thought have some very fine things to teach. The thing we have to keep in mind is this, that wherever we go, and this includes BOTA, except that here I think you have found, those of you who have been coming regularly and those who have not, I'm sure will find, that we help you to guard yourselves against receiving suggestions of being hypnotically receptive. Uh, and reacting to things that you don't know are really so or not. We try to help you to discover just what your powers of consciousness are and how to gain control of these states uh, in order to become more of what you are destined to become and to become it more rapidly because of the various techniques that we teach you as well as methods for understanding who and what you are. All right, then, in these various schools of thought, we do have, as we said, many different ideas that are given out or taught or developed. We know in Christian science there's a complete denial of uh, matter as being real at all. Uh, they call it something like mortal mind, and they say mortal mind, uh, if it's only mortal mind, it's an error, and therefore it doesn't exist, only God exists. But this is uh, being a little irrational, I think, if we will stop to analyze it, because if only God exists, then God must have created whatever they mean by mortal mind to create the error. And anyone who doesn't recognize this has stopped, uh, has stopped really analyzing thinking and reasoning, which makes that person, incidentally, more suggestible to the degree that we accept other people's suggestions, including their teachings, blindly, without of bringing all our own powers to bear on analyzing whatever is being said. To that degree, are we not practicing our true humanness? And being uh, truly human is one of the most fantastic miracles, except that everything is a fantastic miracle. And the more human we become, the more we recognize this. All right, then, this state of suggestibility, or this willingness to receive from other sources, ideas, uh, to receive beliefs, to receive uh, indeed commands, and uh, this is like post-hypnotic suggestion in hypnosis, you know. Under hypnosis, the uh, subject may be told that when you uh, are awakened uh, in ten minutes or so, or at whatever time I may snap my fingers or wink my eye or stamp my foot, it doesn't matter, they give them some symbol to set off the occurrence. Uh, the subject is told you will be insatiably thirsty or you will uh, discover your feet are so hot that you can't stand it or you will be taking off your shoes and you won't really know why. I mean, or some kind of foolish thing or even you might bark like a dog or meow like a cat. Uh, this has been done. And what happens? Here is the thing that helps us to understand our consciousness better. Uh, the post-hypnotic suggestion works. 
for instance, say 10 minutes later, uh, the subject, who is now back into so-called full consciousness, is chatting with a group. And all of a sudden, the subject will go, bow, wow, wow. And everybody will look at them and say, now, why did you do that? And do you know what always happens? The subject gives a very logical reason. In other words, this is what we call rationalization. It gives a very logical reason. Uh, the subject may say something like, oh, I heard a dog barking in the distance, and I just love dogs, and it was just my way of uh, a sort of <coughs> recognizing my affection, or maybe the reverse. It may sound silly to others, but the subject believes it, and it is the believing it, the, uh, the, his, his or her own rationalization, which causes a great deal of trouble when we take into account the fact that this is what we are all <coughs> prone to do in our everyday situations. We do things, or we think things, or we feel things, which really are what you might call post-hypnotic suggestions, or results of suggestibility. Then we take this magnificent consciousness of ours, the self-conscious part of our mind, the magician, and that's really uh, creating a magical act. We make it sound plausible, no matter what kind of nonsensical elements we have, uh, no matter what kind of sickness we have in our souls, what kind of conditioning, what kind of nonsense has been received from other people's immature thinking and feeling. We take and rationalize this so that we know, we don't think, we know that we are right. And what we don't realize is that what we are knowing is what somebody else told us to know. For example, let's take something like the scriptures. Now, I'm going to shock you very much, and this is good, because we all need a little shock. Uh, we need it often. Life would get very boring without the shock, actually. But we take something like the scriptures. Now, how often have you had people say to you uh, in discussion of some uh, religious or philosophical problem. Say, well, but after all, it says so in the scriptures, and that's supposed to end the argument. I wonder if any of you felt that way once, perhaps as children, but you wouldn't be here <laughs> if you had ever gotten fixated into that lovely bit of hypnosis. After all, it says so in the Bible. I mean, how can you answer that? The Bible suddenly becomes sacrosanct. It is something so tremendously holy. It is the word of God. Even where people have raped each other, murdered each other, committed adultery, um, have uh, committed every kind of evil under the sun, and I mean every evil under the sun, <laughs> uh, this is the glorious, miraculous word of God, and that finishes arguments. Well, does it? The fact is, anything that you pick up in a book Anything that has been written has come from a human being. And inasmuch it is, as it has come from a human being, it is subject to the errors of that human being, is it not? Therefore, to collect a group of writings, beautiful though they may be, inspiring though at least a portion of them may be, because to be perfectly honest with you, I've never been very inspired over the fact that uh, a bunch of people gathered together and went out and slew <laughs> another group of people and blood poured and uh, they cried out, God is with us. It seems like everyone who goes in for good heavy killing on the whole, except the communists who go the reverse, they say, ha ha, you see, God is not with you, <laughs> so there is no God. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, Except for that, uh, why our killing instinct are all made something holy and, and special. God is with us. And so off they go with their swords and guns and daggers, and now it's the atomic bombs. doesn't matter what. They, the children get more and more powerfully large, uh, destructive playthings to throw around. And I would say God knows where it will all end if I didn't already know where it will all end. <laughs> And I'm very grateful to the Lord of life that I do know where it will all end. Nevertheless, that is a subject for other, a different talk than the one we're having this morning. The point is that anyone who has achieved a level of true thinking, 
who has released himself from at least a portion of the hypnosis of the undeveloped mass mind certainly is going to have developed enough discrimination enough search and yearning for reality to question the fact that just because something is in a book that makes it absolute holy and true of course you all realize or at least most of you realize that the work of kabbalah is very much involved with the bible and indeed it's only the kabbalist who knows what the bible is meant to represent since it has been those it, it has been those who've been trained in the mystery teachings and in the mystery techniques and therefore had a symbolic language of their own only these knew what they were talking about and the rest of the people have taken a lot of uh, literal translations uh, from things which were symbolically represented in first the oral teachings, then in the writings, and then made uh, a master god out of it. And then they preached to us about not worshiping false images, when where was a greater false image ever worshiped than with our Jewish and Christian people in the Bible and again with other groups in whatever their particular Bible is the Christian scientists with their science of health with key to the scriptures and you know it's a sin to read anything else just like uh, with the uh, Christian ideology it's a sin to uh, become involved with or pay attention to or learn about other things and there was a time when uh, we had a great deal of very spiritual bloodshed if you will recall, because of people having the unmitigated, unspiritual gall to question the fact that uh, the Bible has the word of God, it is truth, and this is the one and only church. And then what happened? Uh, those who were not spiritual enough to see this had uh, were put on racks, uh, they were burned, they were tortured, all for the sake of the soul. Well, the point is, we do this now in other subtle ways this is the bigotry of the mind which is the subconscious part of the mind which is that has received suggestions from incorrect self-conscious uh, evaluation from incorrect self-conscious watching uh, if you'll notice as our beloved reverend harris b case read from the bible uh, where jesus said watch watch you know that's one word but this is so potent. The self-consciousness of man is meant to be continuously on guard. Watch. And what is it supposed to watch? Not other people with great uh, suspicion, though at times that's wise too. <laughs> but oneself, because the first place you have to work in, in fact the only place you can do your primary work in, is with yourself. To become aware of the, or your own subconsciousness. So notice the symbolism, notice the magician uh, holding uh, his magic wand. This is the magic wand of attention, incidentally. The magic wand of attention is receiving the power from above, that is, from superconsciousness or the higher self. And that is why you have the figure eight shown there, too. That's a figure for infinity. And he is receiving this power of attention. And what is he doing? He's planting in the garden. You notice the other hand points down. And you see this garden. Well, the High Priestess is another symbol for the garden because as I pointed out to you before, there are many symbols for the same principles in order to get a fully developed awareness stirred in your own consciousness. Therefore, a person back to hypnosis, under the state of hypnosis, what occurs? This person sets aside his own self-consciousness. I think you can see this. And he permits somebody else, a hypnotist, to uh, take the place of his own self-consciousness. So somebody else then gives suggestions to subcon the subconsciousness of the person under hypnosis. And because the setting aside of self-consciousness isn't exactly complete, but it is set aside in this way that it is focused down. In other words, all of the powers of self-consciousness are focused down uh, into becoming the concentration point for the hypnotist. This is what makes the suggestion so potent under hypnosis, you see, because of this concentrating. 
This is the same thing with us, my darlings. Uh, when we are concentrated down <laughs> with our self-consciousness, that is, uh, locked away from looking over the entire area as we should, when we lock ourselves down, concentrate our uh, awareness or attention down to a small point, like, for instance, the Bible is the word and everything else is of the devil, uh, or uh, if you don't believe in my political party, then, of course, you are under the or in the grip of something very evil, whichever it might be, all of these ideas, there's a focusing down, there's an inability then to look around at the whole picture. I used to, at one time, before it became very dangerous to do so, I used to recommend to people, in order to keep themselves free from the hypnotic influence of all things, I used to recommend that they owed it to their own ability to think and evaluate, for example, in terms of politics, to read no less than at least five types of newspapers and to read them every day, keep one busy. <laughs> that is, they should read the Republican point of view, the Democratic uh, point of view, the Socialist point of view, the Fascist point of view, and the Communist point of view. Then here they are looking at the exact things that are being said. This is an education because you notice then that everybody is doing what? They're trying to hypnotize you into, into uh, being a blister or having a blister in a sense by narrowing yourself down to just that one thought or the one point of view. And I have heard more people say, well, I'm against communism. And uh, although I don't know why, it's just that I, I, I know it's bad because everyone says so. Well, do you know, it's, it happens to be true that communism is something that is a very sad thing in as much as it is at least the communism as the Bolsheviks <laughs> and the Chinese communists present it. It's, it certainly is a very unhappy type of teaching because it is so materialistically oriented. This dialectical materialism, this uh, withdrawal from spiritual qualities, this withdrawal from the reach of the heart and soul to learn from, you know, in ever larger measures and to receive the larger awarenesses from a super, the superconscious level, which we can call God because it is God. This is truly very tragic. And for this reason, uh, certainly I would agree that it is one, but only one of the many false and very false and dangerous teachings uh, that are brought about or given out on this planet. Nevertheless, a person who's against a thing without knowing why, mainly because they have been propagandized for it, you see, is giving up his birthright. You may be against it for the right, uh, for the right, wrong reason, just as much. Suppose you're for something that's good and right, and there are things like thing, uh, relative good, relative evil at a time. But if you are for that something that is good or right without knowing why, but only because you have been propagandized, you're merely being, what, an automatic, suggestible response mechanism. You have given up your own self-conscious powers of evaluation because you need to know why, and you only know why you have certain ideas or thoughts or attitudes. When you have looked into the full picture, and this is what we're here for, to know how all these forces work, then we're in a position to react properly. So what is the great work, according to Kabbalah? The true great work uh, amounts to a, a type of cleansing. And this really is the primary work for an awfully long time, and I'm going to explain why. And what is this cleansing? This cleansing really means that we have to unhypnotize ourselves. We have to throw away all the conditionings we have received that have been forced into us or which we have with lack of discrimination, a lack of practice of our own powers of knowing and learning, received into us because of not being uh, evolved in us at the time, or mature enough, to refuse entry, uh, to refuse to be uh, what you might call a propagandized react reactor to whatever 
people want you to react to. And this is what we are mainly, incidentally, th through the subconscious patterns that are formed by receiving this point of view. So everyone born in a certain religion, they are conditioned from the moment they're born to figure that unless they follow it in exactly this way, they're going to go to hell or whatever is equal to that. And then when their mind starts to work, if they're the type of person who cannot be conditioned or held in the conditioning forever, if the soul is, is reaching out and breaking barriers, along with it because of these, this conditioning, which is a hypnosis, you know. In other words, the receiving of suggestion, drop upon drop upon drop. Uh, what occurs then is that we have these guilt complexes and then uh, these various guilt complexes unrecognized by the conscious mind uh, keep us in a state of tension in a state of unhappiness uh, make us unable to really attain to shall we say constructive relationships that are stable because we're not stable inside we're being washed we're being washed by uh, these furies the fight in other words we keep a battle going inside of ourselves and why? Because we have not yet learned the complete principle that's involved with subconsciousness. And this is uh, what, of course, we are attempting to do is all of the work of BOTA, approaching it from uh, many angles. We go round and round the circle, hitting from each side so that everyone must catch the principle in some way and then get to understand it from uh, the entire circle and be able to see it from any point of view after a while, though this takes time. Now, let me try to show you a few examples of just what happens with subconsciousness and its powers. And incidentally, the powers are remarkable. I mean, after all, keep in mind, it is the power of your subconsciousness which we share with each other. It gives you the ability to project a body, uh, to react uh, with beauty and glory, as well as in the other manner. So that we're not saying that subconscious is, subconsciousness is only a cellar uh, for the filth <laughs> and the immaturity and the nonsense and the hatred. No, because it also contains the knowledge of all things that have has ever been because it is the pattern receiver, as the tarot keys show. And therefore, it also receives patterns from the divine the higher soul and it is along these patterns that manifestation comes the the substance of life collects around the pattern and this is what brings physical manifestation whether it be a nebula a star or a human being there is a pattern from consciousness the higher uh, super consciousness that brings us about nevertheless we as individualized the elements within the one life also have developed powers, the powers of gods, which we are, or little godlets, as I like to call us, since we're not very grown up, and yet it shows us in the spirit of our uh, true being. Uh, as little godlets, you see, we also have been making patterns and receiving patterns from other areas, and some of them have been pretty nonsensical. Uh, in as much as a two-year-old child uh, listening to the radio figures as a man or a woman or hiding behind it to make the music. And this is the belief of the immature. But as we mature, we start to see the thing more clearly. We develop more of the capacity to understand. So the primary job for every true aspirant is to learn how to purify subconsciousness and why it must be purified. And by purification, we do not mean only getting uh, the various elements out of subconsciousness, which uh, fundamental uh, religion tells us to, because some of the things they might want us to get rid of, we might figure they're pretty nice and we want to hang on to them. <laughs> After all, we have some pretty good habit patterns. We wouldn't know how to type those of us who type if we didn't form some excellent habit patterns in order to be good typists. And the same way uh, we couldn't walk if we hadn't formed good habit patterns learning how to balance our body so that we could walk. So it's a matter of what habit patterns, naturally. Now, here is what occurs through subconsciousness. Uh, 
that confuses aspirants so much. And this is one of the perhaps the most important points we need to understand for this morning's talk. Then we'll continue with the ideas through the month, as I told you. Now, for example, let's take uh, various individuals who have been canonized or made saints uh, by one of our large church churches, uh, one of the largest, and see just what has really been done there, what the principle is behind what has occurred. You've all heard of the phenomenon uh, which is called stigmata. Now, those of you who do not know what stigmata is, I'm going to just give you a brief explanation. <laughs> the person under hypnosis has a pencil that's touched to his hand, and this person is told this is a lighted cigarette, and he raises a blister. This is called stigmata. Therefore, a stigmata is the appearance of something on the body, like a burn or blood or a blister, that is not caused by what we ordinarily call physical means. In other words, there was no real cigarette put to the hand. The consciousness believed that there was a, a burning cigarette put to the arm and the blister came. Now then, in all sorts of uh, religious thinking, uh, we have this concentration that people uh, go in for because this is the power of man to concentrate. What we have to do is learn how and where and when and when not, of course. So in this power of concentration, let's say we have somebody who's a natural uh, mystic. And this mystic uh, has a group of images that uh, he believes in very profoundly because he's accepted it. Uh, he's accepted it because he's been hypnotized into accepting it by his parents and his environment and his priest or minister or what have you. And so he has this set of definite beliefs which he knows. He doesn't just believe, he knows it. Because that's one of the problems about believing something. You usually unhappily know it. And some of the things we know are startling. All right? Now, this person meditates on dear Jesus. And this person either a sadist or a masochist, as far as I'm concerned. You may not agree with me. <laughs> and so it gives them great joy and rapture to meditate on the crucifixion of Jesus and to meditate on to, and he becomes terribly inspired over the blood trickling down from the thorns and, uh, the, and the open wound. Uh, the, this is a spiritual thing to him. God knows why. If anybody knows, if you'll explain it to me, I'll appreciate it because I can't have never understood anyone being able to feel an exaltation over pain. Never. And this in itself to me is sick, utterly sick. And I hope none of if you, and any of you have it, you'll go to work and unhave it <laughs> as fast as possible. All right, now there, there's this meditation taking place. And then, oh joy of joys, somebody has become really saintly. They develop stigmata. They have so identified themselves with the suffering of Christ that the blood pours down their face and the wound opens and the hands have the blood and the nails and people come from all around to look and ooh and ah and get inspired and say, oh, isn't God wonderful? Uh, well, if I was going to argue with God, I'd argue with God about the idea that anyone should think that that's wonderful. It's an inevitable part of growth, I realize, and this we have to accept. Pain is necessary to growth. But why we should let ourselves screech uh, and uh, say glory, glory hallelujah over the wonders of it is beyond me, except that perhaps we still have a little of the barbarian in us, and at least the one thing about youth, uh, which is inevitable, we will outgrow it, won't we? <laughs> Whatever it is, that's the thing that comforts me and perhaps the rest of us. So we have this phenomena of stigmata, and of course this is uh, those who, who are, shall we say, suggestible enough who can concentrate uh, intensely enough on a picture that gives them the most excitement or stirrings of whatever kind, uh, they develop this phenomena and they think that it's a very spiritual thing. Well, why should developing the stigmata of the sufferings of Christ be more spiritual than the blister that you get when you uh, put a cigarette on the hand? Will you tell me why? And this is where practically all of religion and all of metaphysics and occultism falls into error by trying to put labels on things and say that the ability to have a psychic phenomenon, because now I will just point out that the phenomena under hypnosis is really a psychic phenomena. 
What is psychic phenomena? It is a phenomena which involves subconsciousness. This is what psychic phenomena actually is. The powers of subconsciousness become more easily seen. They're not so hidden. You know, Isis hides herself behind veils. And under certain conditions, they become more easily seen, especially under conditions of hypnosis. And there are many people with a sort of vehicle so that they can take their consciousness and, in a way, you might say, step aside uh, from the full self-conscious control and, and point it down uh, in such a way that they have a great deal of what we call psychic experiences. Now, this is very interesting because it helps us to see how uh, the subconsciousness works in so many ways. But you see, psychic experiences are no more spiritual than the ability to raise a blister. This is the thing that I'm trying to impress upon you. <laughs> and the ability to raise a blister uh, through suggestibility is completely tied up with the same ideas uh, that uh, are tied up with suggestibility, that is, receiving ideas uh, from other people, being propagandized by other people, accepting their decisions of right and wrong and uh, correct and incorrect, instead of being determined to become the real inheritor of your destiny as soon as possible, that is, by learning how to uh, decide what does and does not go into your subconsciousness and how to understand it. So that in occultism, what we do, we learn to watch. <laughs> you know, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak, as was read to us. Well, what is it that makes the flesh weak? It isn't the flesh that's weak. The spirit is willing, but subconsciousness is conditioned. <laughs> And, sub and the flesh or the body or the actions always go in accordance with the conditioning that, uh, that are in subconsciousness. Now, subconsciousness will always be conditioned, but the idea is what conditionings? Uh, what we decide to condition it with or what we've received from immature levels through past incarnations as well as uh, this childhood because it's a long series that's involved. Therefore, cleansing subconsciousness is vital because Unless we do so, whatever spiritual experiences we have will be colored by our subconscious pictures and beliefs and therefore will not be dependable. You see, the level of receiving, shall we say, revelations, when it comes from psychic level or subconsciousness, is never dependable. There might be one thing right and ten things wrong. There might be nine things right and one thing wrong, and the one thing that's wrong would make the nine things right utterly different from what they would be otherwise, so they're not right after all. It's like the person who's completely imbued with uh, certain of the figures in Christian um, symbolism, who, getting into a suggestible state, receives the impact of certain thought forms and ideas from a group or one. And then suddenly, his spiritual experience, he sees God, like, for instance, as somebody I knew saw Father Divine. Now, this person was an educated person. He saw Father Divine during a meeting on a throne with all the trappings, every detail that we've read about in the Bible was there. And Father Divine sitting with all the harp playing, everything going on. And he had an instant conversion. And he, he left everything and he joined Father Divine's camp. Well, at least the Father Divine camp helped to take a lot of people and teach them how to be more loving, which is more than we can say for an awful lot of other groups I know of. But the point is, as far as he was concerned, Father Divine was the literal God called Jehovah <laughs> because he had this, what? He had this illumination. He had the ecstasy that came with it. He had the rapture that came with it. In other words, he had a message he saw directly into heaven and truth, and that was that for him. That was his truth. But why could he have had that experience? Because of the conditioning. Now, uh, a person who is completely involved in Roman Catholicism will have his experiences in the symbols of Roman Catholicism. Those completely immersed in uh, the Protestant religions, their uh, ex spiritual experiences will have that symbolism, though they're... Uh, they're the weakness with Protestantism is it hasn't got enough symbols. And so it keeps people from having as many spiritual experiences because uh, there's nothing for the, um, the force to wrap itself around. In other words, it wraps spiritual experiences when they are had on psychic levels, are not completely spiritual. 
because it's looking through a window. When you look at a star and I look at a star, we do not experience the same thing because my subconsciousness reacts in one way to a star and yours in another. When I look at a cat, for instance, uh, I adore cats and I love to have cats run me around and, and prove how much more character they have than I have. I have a completely different reaction to my cat than somebody who looks at the cat and doesn't like cats. Why? We're looking through our own subconscious conditionings. Some of them are good, some are bad, some are indifferent, some don't mean anything. Are you starting to see the point? So there isn't any experience we can have if we have it on the level of, of form, if we have it on the level of sound, if we have it on the level of psychic, uh, telepathic intercommunication, which is not wrong. By wrong, I mean which is not filled with false images and therefore mixed. For instance, a person who could be truly psychic and sincere, what? He has an experience. And you see, this happens in your everyday life. I'm showing it to you on that level. Say he has an experience um, of making some kind of contact with what appears to him in the experience uh, to be something that's existing now. As a matter of fact, in the subconscious state, past, present, and future are very much confused. And there's no way of really telling the difference, and people could tell you that the future is something that was. As a matter of fact, even in the, the people who have spiritual experiences, really, the truly higher spiritual experiences, uncolored with subconscious uh, conditionings, have always been able to recognize this, and these, incidentally, are very few. And what we're trying to do with you is train you how to have real ones and not get caught up in these traps because uh, they can uh, see something that has been as something that's going to be, something that was or that's going to be as something that already was. There are all, all the time senses are mixed up because they're seeing patterns in an area where time and space is not functioning as it does here at all. If, and it doesn't even exist as such. There's a different kind of awareness on the psychic, just the psychic level, mind you. But bringing it through subconsciousness, there's all this confusion. So people are having conversations with flying saucer people, with Jupiterians and Nep Neptunians and Venusians, and they're having conversations with Father Divine, and they're having conversations with God, uh, God Almighty Jehovah, and they're having conversations with Christ the Lord. And all they're doing is having conversations with colored images, which may have a portion of spiritual inspiration in it. But it can't come through because the glass, the coloring, changes it. Therefore, to accept, that's why you hear us say so often, to accept what others tell you, including ourselves, just a bl blanket like that, is interfering with your own growth. We want you to develop the ability to know what subconsciousness is. As you work these tarot keys, working with them, help to bring more and more awareness, uh, watching your own states. When I was a little girl of five, I used to watch people's, uh, my own subconscious states, and a couple of times I deliberately told a lie uh, because I was trying to see how other people reacted to it, whether they could tell the difference between a lie or the truth. And in this way, it would help me to understand a little better what consciousness was like. And I was very interested to discover that other people couldn't tell the difference. That if I said I'd taken a, a walk uh, north, and actually I'd gone south, and I had no reason to, this was experimentation. They believed me. And I said, how very interesting. And so I watched myself, and then I watched people, and I started to see their subconsciousness. And I saw how they were believing their own <coughs> nonsense. How I, I would hear people say, oh, I just have such a, a, an unselfish feeling about so-and-so. And all the time I knew that they were just exalting themselves uh, with this feeling of being unselfish, whereas they were being hypocrites because they were making quite a bit of gain out of that situation. And they just got lost in their own self-exaltation. And this I noticed, uh, a principle I keep watching from then to now. So you see, watching your own principles as, as watching the way your own subconsciousness works helps you to understand the way others work. It helps you to protect yourself and to cleanse yourself so that you can receive through super consciousness without these colorations. And that is another thing. I'll talk to you about what that state actually is and is not and how to differentiate more through this group of talks this month. 
but at least now I hope you can understand we are really magical miracles. What we do with our consciousness is, is extraordinary. Uh, to understand what we do doesn't mean that we'll stop doing it, but the miracle of your walking day by day, watching the things you can do, and starting to use it positively so that you can be the healer, you can be the spreader of love and divinity using the same principle that makes you now walk in uh, nonsense. This is the thing that we're after. It isn't becoming different. It's learning how to use what we are for real rapture and ecstasy that we share with each other. <laughs> <laughs>